Welcome to Dan's On Fandoms. I'm Dan. Old friends, deformed clones, the child's blood, and this amazingness. No, hold them apart. <laughs> Good golly, Miss Molly. Chapter 12 was another excellent episode, an episode which dropped some serious bombs and revelations on us. There's a heck of a lot to discuss with this one, so let's dive into our top 7 baller moments from Chapter 12, The Siege. Kicking off our list at number 7, Din and the child working on the Razor Crest. Guys, how freaking amazing and cute was the scene of Din trying to explain to the child which wire to plug in. When my man started speaking as if someone was helping him fix the crest, Danny and I were both like, oh my god, he's got the child working on the crest. We were so excited. First off, adorable. Secondly, in what galaxy does Din think it's a smart idea to have a child mess around with wiring and electrical components? Danny and I couldn't help but smile ear to ear with this scene and chuckle along the way. Little man getting zapped had me cracking up. As hard as Din is trying, he ain't winning no father of the year awards, that's for sure. A plus job with this scene though. Din and the child then have some soup and I thought maybe, just maybe, we'd see our homeboy without his helmet, but not yet. I definitely think this scene is setting us up for the possibility that Din will start removing his helmet more frequently, especially since he's learned there's more ways to live as a Mandalorian than just adhering to the way of the Mandalore and the rules of the Children of the Watch. Din tells the child the Crest won't be able to make it to Corvus since it's in such rough shape, so they'll be making a pit stop on Navarro, which brings us to our number 6 baller moment, the return of Marshal Cara Dune and Magistrate Grieve Karga. Before Din arrives on Navarro, we see Cara Dune take out some Aqualish thugs that have holed up in the same area where the Mandalorian covert was hiding in Season 1. The Aqualish have made themselves at home and even removed the giant Mythosaur skull symbol at the entranceway to the armorer's area. That little creature Cara Dune befriends is super cute. Seeing that little guy eat was great. Din soon arrives on Navarro and Cara and Grief greet him. These two haven't done so bad for themselves since we last saw them in Chapter 8. Cara Dune is the marshal of the city on Navarro and it appears Grief Karga is the magistrate of the planet. Seeing that Mimbanese worker that Grief orders to help fix the Razor Crest was pretty sweet. That species was first introduced in canon in 2018 with the release of Solo. In Legends, however, they were first introduced in 1978 in the Legends novel Splinters of the Mind's Eye as the Kawe. I also would like to add that Carl Weathers is the man. He's done such a phenomenal job in each episode he's appeared in, and I love the look of joy in his face when he saw the child. Weathers also directed Chapter 12 and I think he did a solid job. On to our homegirl Cara Dune, who's now the marshal of the city and has cleaned the place up quite nicely. It's no longer a haven for scum and villainy, and I love this statue of IG-11 in the middle of the city. As the gang heads into the city, we see the Mimbanese eyeing them up, hinting at the fact that that bastard is up to no good. We then see the market is bustling, people seem happy, and they've even added a school in the same building where the client and the imps met with Din, Cara, and Grief in Chapter 8. Din then leaves the child in the school, where we get an excellent scene of the child using the force to steal that kid's macaroons. That child is going to eat Din at a house and home with that hunger of his. We then arrive at our number 5 baller moment. Din, Kara, Grief, and the fledgling Mithral prepare to clean up Navarro for good. Our blue-skinned homeboy from episode 1 returns and we learn why Din was hunting him in the series premiere. Our guy was embezzling and stealing money. The Mithral tells Din that Magistrate Grief is allowing him to work off his debt, which will take him 350 years to do do so, which is ridiculous, and apparently Carbonite can mess up your eyesight, which, damn man. Cara Dune and Grief soon get down to brass tacks and explain that the city falls into a safe green zone. However, there's still an Imperial base left on the planet that's run by a skeleton crew. Their hope is to get rid of the imps so that Navarro could become a trade anchor for the sector, but they need Din's help, which of course he agrees to. Taking us to our number 4 baller moment, the gang prepare to infiltrate the Imperial base. Their plan is simple, overload the reactor that powers the base and blow it up. I love throughout this episode that Grief keeps knocking years off the Mithral's debt to get him to do things he clearly doesn't want to do. The interactions between these two were great. As the Mithral is breaking them into the lift, Din uses his jetpack to fly up to the top of the base, tosses a stormtrooper off the edge, and Cara Dune then drops a dank ferric. Once inside the base, the Mithral points out the Trexler Marauder, which is a similar type of K79S80 Imperial Troop Transport.
transport, which is a repulsor lift ground assault vehicle that we frequently saw in Rebels and actually first appeared in canon with the Star Wars Rebels Jr. novel Ezra's Gamble. They're able to then make their way into the base, taking out imps along the way and acquiring a code cylinder, which they later use to access the reactor and compromise the cooling line so that the base will be destroyed by lava. Once the Mithral takes care of the reactor, the gang stumble upon our number three baller moment, the child's blood is being used to create clones. I love the music that plays as we see these deformed clones for the first time. It's very reminiscent of the music that plays while Sidious tells Anakin the legend of Darth Plagueis the Wise in Revenge of the Sith. We then see a hollow message from Dr. Pershing describe what he's been up to. We last saw Pershing in Chapter 3 in Season 1, who very clearly had a Kamino cloning patch on the sleeve of his jacket in that episode. Pershing explains that they've been using blood from a donor, by that he means the child, in an attempt to make clones, but the experiments have not gone well and they've depleted the blood they harvested from the child in Season 1. My assumption is the experiments he's referring to are in reference to clones being developed as hosts for Sidious's essence. 100% has to be the case. Aside from the music that plays, which again just points to Sidious, Dr. Pershing states that the blood they acquired from the child has a very high M count, aka midichlorian count. In the Rise of Skywalker novelization, we learn that many clones were made for Sidious, but since his power in the Force was so strong, the clone body would rapidly decay, which is why he looked decrepit and was hooked up to that machine in the film. What we're seeing here is the development of clones for Sidious, and the child is the key to developing them, because the experiments require blood that has a high midichlorian count, which the child clearly has. They need more of the child's blood to continue their experiments, because Dr. Pershing was only able to harvest so much blood without killing the child, and the supply has run out. Talk about a goddamn bomb of a revelation. Din and the gang have no clue about the magnitude of what it is that Dr. Pershing is saying, but yeah, this is a huge revelation. We now have some insight into why Moff Gideon will do anything to get the child, which makes me wonder, at some point, will Sidious possibly appear in the series in later seasons? Maybe, and that'd be dope as hell. The group also learns that Moff Gideon survived their fight and that the child is still in huge danger, bringing us to our number two baller moment, getting the child and getting the hell out of Dodge. Din escapes the base first, using his jetpack to bust out and make his way back to the city and get the child. Kara, Grief, and the Mithral, on the other hand, use the Trexlar Marauder from earlier to get the hell out of there. After driving the Marauder over the edge of the cliff the base is on, they're hunted by stormtroopers on speeder bikes and then ties before Din returns in the crest to help them out. Seeing the child's happiness and joy as Din hunted down the ties all while eating space macaroons was wonderful. And then Little Man spits up all those cookies he ate, which, so good. The gang says their goodbyes and Din and the child begin to head to Corvus in the fixed up Razor Crest. We then see our old friend Carson Tiva, the New Republic pilot from Chapter 10 that let Din go, has returned to get a report from Grief of what's happened on the planet, and then he speaks to Cara Dune, trying to convince her to join up with the New Republic, but more on that in a moment. We then arrive at our number one baller moment, Moff Gideon, you old so-and-so, what are you up to? After Din and the child leave Navarro, we see an imp on a light cruiser receive a message from that Mimbenese from earlier, and we learn they've placed a tracking beacon on the Razor Crest. Loved how that imp tells the Mimbanese they'll be well rewarded in the new era, referring of course to the eventual rise of the First Order. The imp then informs Moff Gideon that the tracker has been placed on the crest, and we see that Gideon appears to have some clones or droids or something for himself, which, hmm, are these some kind of super commando stormtroopers, dark troopers, or droids? The imp in the room with Moff Gideon has a symbol on his outfit, which is the symbol for the Imperial Department of Military Research. That that organization was a military research organization within the Galactic Empire that manufactured the armor used by Imperial stormtroopers as well as the flight helmets worn by TIE fighter pilots. I guess we'll have to wait and see, as that's where the episode ends. There is so much to digest with this episode. First, one of the things that I've been thoroughly enjoying with this season is the hints that the show has been dropping about the New Republic struggling to maintain order in the Outer Rim. When the Republic was around, they too had trouble maintaining peace and order in the Outer Rim, and that is only compounded for the very young New Republic. Early in the episode, Grief makes a comment to Din about the Empire being unable to settle the Outer Rim, nor can the New Republic. At the end of the episode, our boy Carson explains to Cara Dune how the New Republic needs all the help it can get. These little details help showcase that, even though the Empire fell, it's not like the galaxy went right back to how the Republic was before it was toppled by Darth Sidious. The New Republic definitely had a hill to climb in rebuilding the galaxy following the Galactic Civil War. And, roughly four years after the Battle of Endor, we're learning the New Republic is still slowly
steadily chugging along in that department. I also don't think it's a coincidence that we've been getting these little nuggets dropped about the New Republic struggling to maintain order in the same episode where we learn that the child's blood is being used to develop clones for possibly Sidious. Same thing in regards to when the Imperial officer refers to the New Era when speaking to the Mimbanese. We're seeing the foundations being laid for Sidious's return for the rise of the First Order and the Final Order. This episode did such a magnificent job in providing those seeds that will blossom later in the timeline, resulting in events that play out during the sequel trilogy. An argument could be made that Gideon could also be experimenting with the blood of a Force-sensitive for other nefarious reasons, but I'm going to say I think we're seeing the early experiments for the clones that will be used for Sidious. I absolutely freaking love it, guys. I wouldn't have ever guessed that Season 2 of The Mandalorian would start dropping Easter eggs that could potentially connect to the sequel trilogy, and that would be so damn awesome. Season 2 has been absolutely stellar so far, and this chapter was dope in so many ways. Next week's episode will be directed by Dave Filoni, and it's titled The Jedi, so you know we're in for an amazing ride in Chapter 13. But what do you guys think about Chapter 12, and what's the purpose of the clone experiments Moth Gideon has Dr. Pershing doing? Let us know down in the comments. Want more Star Wars content? Check out some of our other videos. Please like and subscribe, and stay nerdy.